So, Colby Dickinson, thanks very much once again for joining us on Medics Podcast. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so, after our last chat on your work, uh, The Fetish of Theology, you kindly mailed me a copy of your 2020, I believe, book. Uh, I'll try again in, in the shot. Theology as Autobiography, uh, The Centrality of Confession, Relationship, and Prayer to the Life of Faith. But um, really, as people will probably imagine, this is a book which is focusing on uh, the, the, the interplay between theology and autobiography, which ultimately isn't, you know, it's sort of like a topic which isn't, a stretch because in a sense there is a history of theology which is a history of autobiography i mean famously many people will say this and i guess i'm, I'm not like a literature scholar so I, i'm not sure whether or not i can agree but famously you know the confessions by saint augustine is sort of known as the first autobiography so it's like theology in a way also begins from that 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 strain of autobiography but um yeah i mean why why did you write this book? Yeah, the, many, many reasons, actually. You know, one of them was I had been intrigued for years by the passage in one of Paul's letters where he says, we came not just to share the Gospels with you, but to share our very selves. And I thought, what is so important about sharing the self that it almost rivals the Gospels in a sense? It, it sounded kind of like that to me, like you're coming here to share not just this truth of Christ, but ourselves. And it's these selves that have been deeply impacted by that story of Jesus. And so I was curious, what is it about the embodied life of the believer that has a deep impact on other people's faiths? And when I started introducing, you know, limited uh, memoir and autobiographical writings about faith to my students in introductory classes, I noticed they were so much more captivated <laughs> by these narratives of life and people's struggles and, you know, the, their doubts. And, and, and I thought, okay, how can I play to that? Because they're they're really interested in this material, but not just in a way to make it gimmicky as a, as a pedagogical trick, but actually to, to focus on and to showcase the centrality of someone's life to their story of faith. So the more I did that, the more I began to discover the autobiographical writings that dealt explicitly with issues of faith were actually presenting faith. In a, in a slightly different light that became very provocative to me to rethink how theology itself could be performed. And I started noticing that students were just really eager and really receptive to what it is we were covering. So I began to, to look further into it. And I, I thought, you know, if Augustine's confessions are so central, why had nobody really written many other autobiographical writings, you know, up until the, the 12th century, basically? And I mentioned this in the book, too with Guibert of Nogent, and then, but even his is a strange account of his life and faith. But why was it becoming something so, you know, popular in people's, you know, uh, study of Augustine's Confessions in a more contemporary modern context too? And then why have we had just an explosion of, of autobiographical and, and memoir style writings about faith and about confessions of their faith? Uh, what does that mean for us today? So I, I really started using that as a way to rethink through theology. And because my students were so receptive to this, both students who were coming from Christian traditions, one, some, you know, lots actually were coming from different religious traditions, but especially students who did not want or did not have any sort of faith commitments or faith backgrounds, they were still finding themselves deeply interested in what we were discussing. So that was why I picked this up and thought, you know, we could maybe do this differently by putting ourselves front and center, our very lives and our autobiographical narratives. And it, it had a, a resonance with students that caused me to keep pursuing it. So eventually the book was a result of the lectures that I gave uh, in an introductory course uh, on theology uh, here at Loyola. What do you think it is about autobiography then that, you know, um, specifically you mentioned there that you had students that, that are of, of no faith background. What do you think it was, it is about autobiography that, that in, in relation to theology that, that made them suddenly, you know, have a deeper interest? I think part of it was something that Kathleen Norris pointed to in one of her books about sort of the, the vocabulary of faith and what it looks like today. She says something along the lines, I'm deeply paraphrasing, but, but we need to kind of invent a new theological vocabulary today, one that uses words that we understand better or more popular. And we need to take that and make it relevant. So I think 
what happened for me was I noticed how, uh, I, I remember a few years ago, I, we had a colleague of mine and she was a, a biblical scholar. She retired. And I remember her leaving and saying, I'm, I'm happy to get out of here. These students used to have a, a basic understanding of biblical texts and stories, and now they know nothing. And I thought, well, okay, that is frustrating. I could see that for some, some people, but it also is a wonderful opportunity to reinvent or to translate, as I put it in this book, uh, to translate terms into new contexts. So I would say to students, things like, if you don't like the word sin because it has such a heavy baggage that it carries with it of people being accused of being sinful, let's use words like brokenness or, or words like vulnerability, you know, and let's talk about how isn't there a brokenness or a vulnerability that somehow seems constitutive of us as human beings? And they would say, yes, yes. Well, then, then you talk about the doctrine of original sin in light of that, and they, they're much more, you know, inclined to say, oh, this makes sense. I see where we're going with this. So part of what I'm doing in this book the whole time is performing these acts of translation, where I'm saying, you know, if if this word in the theological you know, tradition or heritage strikes you as odd or you don't understand it, because they don't know these stories, they don't know these teachings, substitute something else in there that we do understand. And suddenly these stories of people's lives and struggles began to take on a whole new relevance. And so then even when they began to, the, the characters in these memoirs and autobiographies, when they began to talk about faith and to say, this is where I found faith, students were able to say, oh, I, I could see the relevance of that, even if I don't describe that experience of hitting rock bottom, you know, and finding something larger than myself, even if I wouldn't describe that maybe as something bound to a particular religious tradition or the Christian tradition, even though that's what I focus on in this book, they began to see the relevance of some of these shifts in a person's life and the ways in which, you know, salvation, which we, which we translate as wholeness or healing, you know, or finding something beyond yourself that speaks to you and changes you and transforms you. Uh, they began to see the relevance of that in a whole new way. Mm. Yeah. I've, I've often personally found the, uh, you know, when I was coming to the faith, the, when you're struggling with a, a passage, you can't really relate to it, or you think that's a bit severe, you know, it's a bit bit harsh. You, often, if you go to the Greek or the the Hebrew etymology, and you find that as you're as you're doing here, this translation of sort of going back to the context or things like this, you know, what a big one for me. I mean, you know, you mentioned the, the sort of the, the famous one like sin, repent is another one. These are like big, heavy words. You think, blimey, you know, I, what do I do with this? And one for me was fear. Um, so the, the, this whole idea of like fear of God, right. And the English language is really terrible. Like we, we, we really, even though we, we might have like 20 different words for fear or something like that, none of them really move away from the idea of being scared of something. And then I remember I was reading a book by Eve Congar and he emphasizes like, no fear is in the, in the translation fear is to hear. It's just to hear God. And to, so like to, to fear God is just to admit to that thing that you, you're hearing, like to be awestruck. And I thought, well, why didn't you just say that? You know, this changes the whole thing. So, so you feel you feel in autobiography that this, I guess, in 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 individuals writing honestly and sincerely, that they perhaps don't feel the, you know, that they they just let the lang this language come through more naturally than if you were to write, you know, sort of theology proper. Yeah, I believe so, and I, I love your example there because. We, we came across, you know, words like fear in, in our discussions in that class. And um, we would talk about what does that mean? What could that mean? How could we see it differently? I love this idea of it being hearing. Um, one of the, I remember talking about the idea of fear in the context of something the poet Christian Wyman said, and that's one of the chapters in this book as well, his autobiography where he struggles with cancer and, and, and wondering if he's facing his imminent death. And he talks about, you know, really faith is something that you put yourself at risk in. You have to put yourself at risk. And if you don't, you're not really engaged in it. And I remember thinking at the time when I was teaching it, you know, like, what does it mean to put yourself at risk? And I talked about how there was an element of fear in that. Like, you know, I enter into this relationship, not really certain of where it's going. And I'm scared in that process because that's part of the vulnerability I'm feeling. I'm taking this broken self that I bring to this conversation and I'm scared to put this in dialogue with something beyond me that could transform me. There's a fear in that process. And I, I equated it, you know, my translation then was to say it's like Wyman's notion of being at risk in, in taking that leap toward what faith can be for a person. Just another possible translation, but I like hearing too. It's like I'm I'm responding to what it is that I'm seeing, and I'm willing to enter into and engage that relationship, even if I know it's going to change me and transform me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. I like just to sort of 
<laughs> rebound from that. I like that idea of faith is always being at risk because it's sort of something I've been writing about just today, actually, about you know what the the, the Christian notion of charity and thinking about the uh, the widow's offering of the two pennies, right? And this idea that she gave everything that she had, and the idea of ultimately that when you come to real charity, there's a risk involved there. You know, sometimes we'll just throw our loose change in into a into one of those charity pots but it's like I, I that's not real charity is it because ultimately that i wrote about it as being actually that's for my benefit because i don't even like having change in my pocket so not only do i get rid of the annoying change i get to feel good about myself as well but there's no <laughs> risk involved right um and you also you know if you donate clothes i remember i was donating some clothes and i <laughs> i looked at them all laid out on my bed and i said yeah they're just all the clothes i really don't want anymore right so what, like how is this charity in any sense um and I guess, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. Well, I was just, I was just going to say that that actually, I, I love that reflection because um, one of the things I was definitely moving toward in this book, and I developed as one of the main underlying themes in every chapter in a way, was this idea of a, a poverty. You know, part of why I think students really liked looking at personal individual lives is because when you see a life on display, you see sort of the reality, but you also see sort of the poverty of the individual. These are not. The, you know, it's not like these stories are painting each person in the best possible light. In fact, most, I would say every chapter I, I went through, every author I worked with, I chose them in particular because they were willing to air their dirty laundry. They were willing to say, like, this is not the best story of me or how I handled this situation. And, and what we began to see through that was they're not just willing to be honest about who they are and about what they're experiencing. They're willing to actually live it out as a principle. And that, that really helped me to explain to students what, what, poverty is or what poverty of spirit is or poverty is a spiritual principle. It's a willingness to not just enter into a relationship that puts you at risk. It really is something that sort of hollows you out and deepens you in a way. And I think for me, that was such a powerful thing to see with each of these authors. They they began to talk about their, their experience of faith, not as like, so this is what I was thinking of when you were talking, not as like, uh, I work at a Catholic school, so not as like priests in robes or bishops who are looking regal and are like displaying this, you know, sense of pomp and glory. No, they began to see lives of faith as people who were shattered. And I thought of that, and I kept going back to that in the book. Um, I talk about how for most of the authors, finding faith and conversion was described as uh, shattering, a derealization, <laughs> you know, a loss of reality. Uh, their world is upside down, you know, and I think students could relate to that more because they would say, oh, it's not, it's not like this image of something perfect and pristine. It's more an image of I'm falling flat on my face. Mm -hmm. And actually that's part of the experience of finding faith. It's not this happy go lucky thing. And, and I, so again, there was a permanent challenge to a lot of images of what people thought faith is because we, especially students in the college years, they tend to think of it as I should be happy and fun and I believe and it's all good. And well, no, what if the experience is actually one that reveals my limitations and mm. hollows me out in a way? So so why would, why would so many, so many people, you know, sit down with pen and paper and honestly write out the worst of themselves and, and for other people to see as well? I think there's something deeply... I mean, obviously it could be a cathartic experience and in the day, the age in which we live, I mean, certainly there's for some people, a, there could be an appeal toward a, I don't know, celebrity or something like people want to, it's like watching reality TV. We want to see the worst of it. It's a sort of a spectacle, but I think what, what drew me to the accounts that I, I, I wanted to write about and I wanted to study with students and to, to share was the, the honesty seemed to come from a place of recognition that the confession of faith stating what it is you believe, and that's how we traditionally think of a confession of faith, stating what it is you believe is inseparably connected, and it's inherently connected to confession as an act of, I'm going to speak about my brokenness and where I'm off. And I think we've sort of separated those two things. A lot of people think, you know, confession of faith is like a strong, powerful statement of, I believe this, and you know, historically, of course, and other people are wrong for believing other things. But then we we sort of miss out that the idea of confession has this other meaning. It's like a confession and, you know, I'm admitting what it is that I've done wrong. And I think we tried to say those are separate things. But the beauty of these particular narratives for me was that you began to see how they become the same. To mm -hmm. profess what they really do believe, which may not sound like a traditional historical doctrinal statement of faith, um, really is also inseparably tied to 
their confession of their their sins and their faults. And when you could see in these narratives how they're intimately linked, it becomes for me a very powerful form of witness or testimony about what faith can actually be in a person's life. Um, I'm thinking of like Tolstoy, Tolstoy's confession, so beautifully written, but it's it's also such a powerful statement about about how he re-envisions faith, right? Tolstoy's faith was not a uh, orthodox faith of, you know, he's just simply following what the church is, is telling him to do. He's really sort of rewriting what faith is, and in a certain ecclesial context, but he's rewriting it because, because of his life. His life dictates to him that it has to be such. And so you see this powerful rereading of what faith can be, his confession of what he believes, at the same time as he's confessing his own faults and sins and saying, I completely missed the point of what I thought faith was, and I have to rethink this whole thing. So for me, that was part of the power of, of seeing these narratives unfold in the way that they did. Mm. I guess the thing is, when you, when, you, when you sit down to write something like that, something so personal, ultimately, it's, it's probably, it's fairly difficult to lie to you. You, you can lie to yourself, and you could lie to the page. But it's going to be pretty difficult to do it and you you're going to unearth every as you put as you put the words down you're you're you know it's sort of a therapeutic or cathartic practice of suddenly you see all the all your faults or your your problems come to light um but i mean yeah. one one thing i outlined and i perhaps i was a bit off the mark with this question in a way you know the, of course there's this problem for any writer of you have the the thing in your mind which you want to the experience the the vision, the knowledge that you want to articulate to someone else, you want them to understand. Um, and do you think this problem changes a little bit in, in, in terms of autobiography, in terms of faith? Do you think it's more of an honest look? Here's what faith is to me. It's not necessarily a, that you want people to have the same experience or understand the experience exactly. It's just, you know, here is my experience of having faith. I think so. I think, you know, one of the things that struck me as sort of a guiding principle regarding the honesty of, of the authors I was working with came in, in the form of Mary Carr's introduction to her, her memoir, Lit. Um, you know, she says, anyway, I tell this story, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that was such a powerful statement to begin with. You know, we're going to shape our narrative in some way. And even though I'm trying, and, and Mary Carr, I think, was trying very hard to be as honest and as authentic as she could, and she even, you know, sent manuscripts to people to have them fact check. Is this, is this what you remember? Is this what happened? Um, she realized, you know, you're going to shape your narrative in a certain way to present your life however you want to present at that point. And in a sense, that is a lie. It's a very deliberately crafted statement to put your life in a certain in a certain view, you know, to take it as a certain perspective. So I read a ton of autobiographies and most of what I read did not make it into this book because even though I, I believed, let's say I believed the authors, I believed what it is they were presenting, some of them did not ring true to me as far as the statement they're giving of what faith became for them. It didn't come about in order to expose the vulnerability of who they are and to, to really demonstrate, like I said a moment ago, how the confession of faith is also the confession of their own vulnerability. Some of them were, oh, like, you know, I'm going to try to take faith and make it into something that gives me a strength that bolsters my view and sort of defeats my enemies. Um, you know, and I, I thought, well, this is not exactly the vision of faith that I think, uh, you know, rings true for me in a sense. Mm -hmm. I probably appropriate, I probably appropriate also a, a sentiment I tend to take, which is, you know, when I read poetry, I, t I rarely ask, you know, of a poem, did this really happen? <laughs> what <laughs> I'm looking for is, is a deep resonance with the truth coming out of that poem about the human experience. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, these, these autobiographies I was working with in particular, they rang very true about a certain process of theology as a deepening of that vulnerability and a movement toward it, even if it's maybe they're not fully confronting the realities of who they are. I'll give one example. I think with, uh, uh, with Henry Nouwen or, or Henri Nouwen's work, uh, the Dutch priest, you know, he, he, part of his autobiography was a journal he kept when he moved to uh, the Daybreak community, a large community in Toronto. And I know based on biographies of now and that he wasn't fully being honest with us in his in his journal. There was more going on in terms of, uh, you know, maybe his sexual attractions uh, or, you know, struggles with personal personal issues regarding his identity. Um, and some of that just doesn't come up in here. Maybe he wasn't being transparent with himself. I think to some degree, not able to admit some things. And maybe some of it's just discretion. He thought maybe it wasn't appropriate to go into some stuff. Um, but of course, 
you could also see a certain truth coming through in the book because he's he's a little more than obsessed with you know <laughs> one you know a gentleman who doesn't come to visit and doesn't come to stay and he's very hurt and you know and he writes about this in his journal um so there's a certain limitation but at the same time the way in which he confronts his own shortcomings in relation to this whole narrative of faith he's spinning about working with those who are most vulnerable and and trying to be present to those people and there's still a great truth coming through it. And I say that too, even in light, since I even wrote the book, right? Um, I think it was after the book, uh, how the founder of large community was then accused of uh, inappropriate sexual behavior with members of the, of his community. So even the way in which now portrays this, you know, Jean Vanier's vision for this community, uh, uh, even that sort of takes a blow and there's more truth coming out of it. But I don't think it ultimately, you know, deflates what Nowen's doing in his narrative. It's a beautiful account of the fragility of human bodies and the way in which even our embodied being plays a role in accessing this faith and what faith is. Uh, so I, I, I thought, yeah, there's so many ways to view that, but those are some powerful reminders to me of how truth can speak through these texts, even if we're not fully aware of what is fully, you know, going on in the lives of these individuals. I like the idea though, of someone going back through their past and asking other people, did this actually happen? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, fact checking your own life is a, is a pretty good metaphor for it in a way, but there is, there is something you brought up there, which I think is interesting it, uh, sort of reading between the lines of the biographies that, the autobiographies that worked and the ones that you thought, ah, you're, you're, I don't know, throwing in little pinches of something to sort of drum up the idea of what you maybe wished the, the, the experience had, had been. And this is a huge question. I think it's a, an extremely important question. Um, today is this idea of, you know, being a true or real or complete or, uh, orthodox but not in relation to orthodox christianity but like you know i am the real deal christian muslim whatever it is this idea of like i've found oh no you you well if you want to be a real christian you need to read x y z and you need to you need to do this certain type of mass and oh you don't cross yourself you know like when you go out of the church or something like this right like there's 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 this you know to draw back on your other work this fetishization of being the real deal. And do you think that's where maybe these other biographies that you read where you thought, eh, it doesn't quite work is because there was some sort of um, striving, you know, to be, to be real. Yeah. I think you know, one of the, one of the things that really moved me as I worked through these autobiographies was in fact, the way in which so many of them, I would say all of them, that's, this was the appeal, uh, were willing to confront sort of their own limitations, even psychologically, the ways in which they frame their faith story or coming to faith, not only did it not always present them in the best light, but it continued. They, they developed a, like a self-critical, self-reflexive awareness that continued to come through in their narrative. Even when they had found their faith, so to speak, they still knew it was a never-ending process. It's a never-ending thing I have to go through to see where I may be you know, to use the, to use the word again, where I may be fetishizing my faith or my image of myself, um, my image of myself as a faith filled person. I'm thinking of like Teresa of Avila, you know, uh, her autobiography is one of the ones I deal with. And she says beautifully at, at numerous points, I became a nun for the wrong reasons. I did this. I did not do this for the right reasons. And now I found myself saying, you know, I, I have to like allow myself to be shattered. That was her word. Allow myself to be shattered by the experience of faith again and again and again. And whenever I, it's kind of, you get the sense of whenever I think I found who I really am in this faith, I, I learned a new lesson about how I know nothing. And then, you know, when I work through Ignatius's text, because both Ignatius and Teresa are writing at the dawn of, it's the Reformation, but it's sort of the dawn of a more rational, critical look at oneself. Ignatius is also saying, yeah, I had these ideas of faith where I thought I had to starve myself and I let my nails grow too long and my hair grow too long. And I almost stabbed a man on the, you know, who was a Muslim man who walked in the South of Spain because I thought he insulted the Virgin Mary. Uh, and you're just like, oh my goodness. He's being wonderfully self-critical of his earlier ideas of what he thought faith was, because as he put it, I'm trying to discern still how the spirit is speaking to me. And I don't have to, you know, try to be some idealized image of a saint. As he thought St. Francis and St. Dominic were, he said, I just need to be whatever it is I'm called to be. And I need to follow that more seriously than anything else. And I, I continued to see these self-critical examinations come up so that by the time you get to the end of most of these autobiographies I focused on, 
you get this feeling of no one has it figured out. No one has a strong sense of what the ideal is that they need to be now. They just don't feel so tormented. They just don't feel so lost. They've allowed something to speak to them that they can then rearticulate as their own confessional story. And that's enough. That's enough. So I, I always, I point to this, you know, talk about the idealized vision. So I, mean, I always think um, one of my favorite lines of all the autobiographies I read was the completely underwhelming conclusion to Ignatius's autobiography, where he simply says, you know, we worked hard and with, with God's favor, some things were put in order. <laughs> and I really take that as like, the that's the pinnacle of it. Like, did I, did I find a light shining down from heaven that opened everything up for me? No, I mean, some things were put in order. Mm-hmm. And that's probably about enough. <laughs> so I, I I take that with my my yeah. hopes at the end of some of these autobiographical narratives. That's about all you can. That's about all you can hope for, really, in this world. <laughs> um, but it's, there was something you said there, you know, uh, especially with regards to Saint Teresa of Avila and the, the idea of you know how I know nothing, you know, bringing myself back to nothing again and again, this shattering. Um, and how can it be that someone, you know, we're sort of called to be, to be nothing, to to be humble, to be as children, and everything about, seemingly everything about writing a biography or an autobiography of, you know, this is me, this is my life. Look at look at my life, especially if you want to put it in front of other people. This there's sort of this unavoidable uh, tethering to what we might consider ego or self. And how how do these two seemingly uh, anathema things of sort of ego and uh, this is this is like an egotistical story about how i'm trying to not be egotistical in the world and be humble how can that how can that work it's a great question because i i sometimes feel like every everybody who's writing to some degree is going to have that struggle with you know i'm asserting myself as the author this is me with my voice Uh, i have to engage that to some degree um, and I, I do feel like with the autobiographies, certainly everyone's saying to some degree, this is my story. Listen to what I've gone through. And it reminds me of Paul's letters where he'll say strange things like, you know, I say this not to brag, but I could brag, but not, but not to brag. But I'm going to I'm going to say, you know, emulate me in some way and, and follow this because I do think there's some lesson to be learned here. But only and I think Paul says this beautifully in his own letters, but only in so far as I can really demonstrate to you my own brokenness, that I'm not even what I think I am to myself. And Paul has these wonderful passages where he speaks about, uh, you know, to the Jews, I'm a Jew, to the Gentiles, I'm a Gentile. I thought I was more this, but turns out I'm not this. Everything is taken from me in a sense because I die with Christ. My, my life dies. And I think that to me is, and that's why I begin this book with a, a real, a sort of a deeper dive, not too deep, I'm not a biblical scholar, but a deeper dive into some of the biblical reflections on the centrality of lives and stories of faith. Because when Paul talks about this, you get the sense that Paul, you know, is he sounding bragging at times? It's, and he even has to confront that in his in his language. But then he has to say, but only insofar as I'm, I'm bragging about losing everything, I'm bragging about being destroyed. And so it's, it is a battle with the ego, and he's consciously reflecting on that. And I think that's what spoke to me in the autobiographies that I chose, because they were battling their own egos. They were battling themselves. I, I love how Teresa and Ignatius both, again, around the same time in history, they, they have these wonderful lines where they say, I'm having an experience of God, but is that is that my imagination, or is that actually God? And then they both conclude I can't separate those things. I should never even want to separate those things. My imagines, my imagination is going to play a role in how I shape the story or how God speaks to me. There's no way around that. And that, it, to me, is it's humility to admit that, but it's also a very realistic portrait of the struggle with our own our own selves. I'm going to have moments where my ego is going to want to assert itself, but how do I deal with it? And do I recognize it? And will I confront it? And I, I saw it sometimes more pronounced than others. But I saw that struggle in each of these biographies that I was working with. They were willing to say, my ego wanted to do this, and I had to speak to it like this. And it seemed to me that the way in which they struggled with that very clearly mirrored what Paul had spoken about in his letters. Mm-hmm. And something very authentic in Augustine's confessions you know, also resonates with that. I'm confronting myself in this way. And so I, I think you know, you're asking that question about how does that clash work? I don't know as if there's a formula or model for how it has to work, but I think at least each of these authors addresses that, acknowledges that, says, yes, that tension is real and it's never going to go away. 
And that's the primary thing we have to address before we can do anything else. Uh, and so I, I think your question is essential. And I don't think any autobiography is going to come across as realistic or believable or honest unless the person recognizes their ego is asserting itself in very significant ways. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to try and deal with it in, in hopefully helpful and constructive ways. Yeah, I mean, this sort of reminds me of the, the idea that really humility is honesty. And, you know, speaking of St. Paul, the, the you know, right at the end where he's about to basically meet his, you know, meet his death, knowingly meet his death, he, he you know, on first reading, you think that's quite arrogant and quite self-assured. He speaks of, he, he's, you know, self-assured in the fact that he's going to heaven sort of thing and he's going to get these rewards. And you think that's quite arrogant, but then actually it's extremely humble because it would be like a false pride to say, oh, I don't know where I'm, I don't know where I'm going to go. He's obviously had some, you know, moments of faith or revelation. And, um, you know, he's just this, like, this is, this is, this is what it is. And there's, there's, there's nothing else I, I can write other than what it is I know right now. And it's sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a point where honesty t toes a very, very fine line, I guess. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I like that. So, I mean, we sort of touched on this a bit, but, but what, I mean, what are the reasons why someone would do this? Why would you, you know, I mean, St. Augustine, of course, is the, the famous case because, you know, as he's writing, you know, his sort of infamous stealing of uh, stealing of the pair, which now you think, blimey, that's all you did and you wrote this whole confession? Oh, dear, there's no hope for me. But, you know, ultimately, many of these, many, well, I would say perhaps all, are writing something that you you wouldn't want to write. So why why do that? Yeah, I think, you know, my discovery, so to speak, my discovery of the importance of autobiography for theology is that in many ways, I think they did it as, again, as a witness or a testimony, and not just to their own personal struggles and finding some sort of liberation from them or, or hope in the midst of the darkness. But actually, I, I started to believe, and, and I do think this is part of that, maybe giving your account, giving an account of your story and your life as your faith, it may be the best way to illustrate faith and the best way to also illustrate what theology and you know should be. Mm. I began to think maybe theology needs to be focused on the ways in which we tell our stories and we just don't know how to do this. And so we get at times more sensationalized accounts of people's lives. And again, it's like reality TV stuff it becomes a spectacle. And we actually don't know how to deal with the reality of putting our own lives at risk in faith as the central part of what faith should be. Mm. It reminds me of uh, writing instruction. You know, I also get students who come to me and say, is it okay if I use first person pronoun in my writing? And I think the truth of it is for so long, we've told students as educators, I'm speaking generally, don't use I, you know, don't refer to yourself in your writing. That's not good writing. And I think we're getting to a place now where we're realizing actually you can do it. And sometimes it adds a little authenticity to what you're writing. It makes an argument even more appealing or, or seems to buttress your, your style of writing in a better way. And yet we're really kind of poor at learning how to put ourselves into these conversations. We don't, we're not taught by, by educators, you know, writing instructors. How do I, as a person in my story, how do I fit into this way of writing this narrative? And then we get people who do like, for example, in the field of theology, people who do contextual theologies, as we call them, who will argue, actually the I, you know, where I speak from and where I come from is central to the work that I'm doing. It's not just peripheral. It's a central piece of the argument I'm going to make. I speak from this position, right? So like in feminist theory, you know, way of standpoint theory is a way of speaking about, I need to account for my privilege or my position in order to make clear the argument that I'm putting forward. And in many ways, I think what theology has yet to fully, you know, confront itself with, although many contextual theologians are doing this quite well already, is to be able to say everyone's social position, you know, this I needs to be involved in the writing we're doing, but not just in terms of recognizing privilege and power struggles and how that plays out. Maybe the very nature of my life, even the most intimate struggles I have in a sense, could be really, really helpful for me to get a hold of and understand how all of that brings me to the place I am. Mm -hmm. And that may be where actual faith is, is experienced and maybe where real theology is to be performed. And I think theology still, even though contextual theologies are doing a great job of saying, let's, let's focus on the I, I think we're still a long ways from understanding that maybe 
the autobiographical memoir, even like Mary Carr's struggles with alcoholism or, you know, Tolstoy's struggles with, with his wealth and you know, his context. Uh, these things might actually be the way to redefine how faith exists in a person's life. Maybe it's the most appropriate way. Maybe we should be teaching courses, you know, on theology that begin with, let's talk about you and where you're coming from and how, you know, your story and your struggles are what articulate the place of faith you find yourself in. Because honestly, go through most churches today. And I think a lot of people are there or not there because of some very, very deeply personal experience. And have we really talked about how that should or could be integrated into, you know, from a theological perspective? I think we're still a little behind the curve on that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess I'm going to tread a little bit, tread once again close to the idea of the real here. But do you think that's what's happening in, you know, you spoke at the start, uh, sort of biography and confession as this sort of merged thing. And do you think in confessing, you know, if it's to be a genuine confession, it has to be sincere, of course. Do you think in disclosing, in confessing, in in opening up in that way, uh, the, the, the sort of the moment when the individual comes face to face with faith and has to offer something up in a way is really, it's almost like a split between the individual of, oh, there goes my personality, my ego that I, that I, was sort of flimsily holding on to. And now if I'm to do this, if I'm to, to sort of follow this path truly, then wow, here's my, here's my real self. And it doesn't always look that good. Yeah. And I think that would speak volumes too, to those religious persons who are so concerned with upholding a certain image, uh, some sort of idealized saintly image or a purity image, or those who have you know a sense that being faithful or being a religious individual means following simply a moral code. Uh, it really would help to sort of critique those images as well and say, this is not what it's about. It's about you confronting your ego. It's about you confronting what it is you thought you could be. It's you confronting this idealized vision of yourself and realizing what you might be being called to do is to, to, to wrestle with that, you know, maybe even to sort of suspend your sense of self at times to, as Paul puts it, to die with your image of Christ or your image of God, to die with your image of your own self as well. And then to find a way through that, not to just forget it, not to just ignore it, but to find a way through that to a more vulnerable, tender, but also a more realistic depiction of who you are. Um, I think that's very much what's happening. Uh, And the possibilities are very, very deep to reimagine how a lot of people see religion, period. I mean, it's how many times have I been part of a church community or raised in a church community or, or see it even on campus these days where the people who are very faith filled tend to be someone who have like this idealized image of what that means to be someone of faith <laughs> instead of the reality of, well, it means I have to confront my own brokenness. That's a whole different thing. That's a whole different thing. Mm. Uh, and will I be able to let go of that? And I'm not so sure people want to confront that. It's why for me too, a lot of this speaks uh, more along the lines of like St. John of the Cross's dark night of the soul. <laughs> you know, it's my, my mystical spirit here, but that really it's about a loss of something and, and it feels like a darkness, but that may actually be the way that, you know, we need to confront ourselves and, and who we are. And that may be what the whole faith journey is really about. And I think these, you know, these memoirs that I picked here, these autobiographies, I think really spoke to those issues at their core. And that's why I found them so valuable. Yeah. You know? mm. Well, I guess, I mean, you know, just to go back to St. John of the, St. John of the Cross is one of my favorites as well. And the dark night of the soul of this ultimate, this sort of, um, this, yeah, ultimate stripping back. I mean, you know, here's the question. What what are you once you've taken away everything, but whatever it is that remains, you know, this sort of paradox of now everything's gone. What are you? But you don't really know because you've never looked, because you've always had these distractions. You've always had, you know, I guess for St. John of the Cross, this small window of uh, sensuous data coming in that you can somehow sort of, oh, you know, I'll ignore myself and, and go and dive out there into the world. Um, and I guess that's what's being disclosed in a biography is you're beginning from actually nothing. You're finally looking at yourself and without all the trinkets attached and saying, okay, what's here? And do you think, do you think a lot of people are finding it's a lot less or a lot more than they expected? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's both. I think for a lot of people to, to confront that, is what leads into a space of saying, wow, this is not what I imagined faith was supposed to be about, that I'm losing what I thought was dearest. I'm I'm dropping this idealized image. I can learn to embrace at least some form of this principle of poverty in my own relationship to myself. 
uh, and understand that that may be who God is or what God wants, you know, to show us of God's own self, a canonic image in the Christian tradition. But this idea of being poured out or losing who I thought I was is part of the journey that I'm supposed to go on. That's so much more less in the sense of it's not an ideal. It appears not to be a strength that I once thought it was going to be. It's rather a weakness. But it's also more because then now I've got to actually go into a weakness and allow myself to engage that and come across as something I thought I would not be. So I think it, it becomes both. And I, then that then it makes sense. I think it, it makes sense of, but also helps us to understand in a, in a much deeper way. Paul's comments about, you know, to follow Christ or to be crucified with Christ means you are, you're, you're, what you thought was strength becomes a weakness to the, you know, and what you think is weak actually becomes a strength. And I, that inversion so it's like John of the Cross is it's a darkness that actually illuminates mm. the path we need to go down. Uh, it's paradoxical, yes. But I think, and for that reason, it will appear as so much more and so much less at the same time. Um, but it's absolutely fundamental to the journey and the process, I think. What do you think the limits of this kind of biography are? I mean, at a very surface level, for some people who who think they're going to read a book and they're going to, they're going to discover a model or an ideal to follow. They're still idealizing things like that, you know, a saintly holiness or purity. It becomes a little disillusioning. Is this even worth going into? Um, I think that can be one of the immediate obvious limitations for some people. I think for others, the big limitation is it's too hard. It's too much. It's not, you know, in that sense, it's not what I expected. And I want to, I want to be rid of it or to, to not have this. I would like a fantasy ideal to follow. So I think the limits can be that sometimes the way in which the story is crafted may not speak to some people because they'll they'll not be ready to receive it, which sounds like a another biblical principle. You know, let, let those with the ears hear this. I mean, I think for some people, they're not ready to hear certain images of what the path may look like. Um, and that can be very difficult. So I, I think those are some limitations in that sense. But if you're referring to, to like limitations of the genre itself, um, I think it can become some self-indulgent, as we talked about. You know, the ego can really reassert itself in certain ways uh, and, and at, from the author's perspective. Again, these are a lot of the autobiographies I read that did not make it into the book, which was most of them by far. So I think for some of those authors, there's this limitation of, well, I do want to, I want to write a bestseller. I'm going to tell my story. People will want to read it. They'll find it so interesting. Or I do, I do think I'm an ideal to be emulated and people can follow this ideal. Um, that's a significant limitation. I think it actually derails a lot of the projects that are out there in this genre of spiritual autobiography that really are not worth reading, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, it's rather the ones that confront themselves and their own failings in a very realistic way, I would say they're the one to emulate, but that emulation is not an idealization. And so that can be part of a limitation too. But I don't know if that answers your question fully, if there's something else you were thinking of as far as the limitation. No, no, no. I think that that does answer my question, but it it brings a sort of curious follow-up. And I don't want to sort of quantify uh, all these biographies, which are ultimately of different qualities. Um, but the sort of there you, you're getting at the end, what, what might be the criteria for... Uh, such a biography to be a success you know is there is there something you see that biographies all of them actually are trying to do something do you think they are trying to bring people to faith or do you think actually maybe some of them weren't trying to do anything they were just saying here's my experience and but i think you'd have to be extremely humble to just say here's my experience and not have some little thought of expectation or what you think it might do to the world I, I kind of go back. I mean, this is my own rule of thumb. I, and I don't know if it's a good measure at all. I don't know. <laughs> but I go back to the idea of poetry and, and questioning whether a poem is is good or real. It, it's just the way it hits you. You know, you read it and you say, the way this speaks, it it brings out a truth in my own experience that I find very profound. And I, I think it's it's formative in the sense, you know, and it can also be a, a real benchmark or a measure for how I should confront the reality of my life. But it's only insofar as I'm deeply able to resonate with that experience. It, the truth is a resonant experience. I'm, I, I've been reading a lot of Hartmut Rosa these days, and he's got a great book on resonance where he talks about these are the things that move us so deeply because we resonate with them. And I think the autobiographies I was reading through, I resonated with them, but I also saw this is this is how I almost more important. It wasn't that I personally always did. What I saw Paul writing about or what I saw the biblical narratives writing about 
and the way they formed their life stories of people of faith, I thought that resonated deeply with these other spiritual autobiographies. And I was using that as sort of the measure is, you know, is the way in which Paul can confront his own brokenness and his loss of identity. Is that something that resonates with what I'm reading in these autobiographies? And I began to see, yes, that is happening. There's definitely a connection here and it helps to illuminate a lot of what Paul writes about in his letters. So I, I, I guess the best I could say is something along the lines of, you know, do people resonate with it? And, and if they do, there's a reason that they do. So when you read Augustine in the Confessions, why has it lasted so long through so many centuries? Well, because people have resonated with his story. They find something in there particularly helpful to illuminate their own struggles. And I think it's no surprise then that Tolstoy's narrative sort of takes an Augustinian track uh, in some ways. I remember having dinner with Mary Carr and I asked her about I said, you know, uh, I noticed your your memoir lit kind of followed an Augustinian confessions uh, narrative style, and she she was like, yes, it did, mm. <laughs> or something something along those lines. I mean, because we resonate with those stories, we say, you know, I, I'm putting words in her mouth here going forward, but you know, it's like as if Mary Carr was saying, I resonated with Augustine's experience, and so I found a way to sort of incorporate that into my own depiction of my life story. It makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. We're moved in those ways. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think it's we have to be aware of how that takes place and how that is written and codified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that speak to what you're... It does, yeah. No, no, it does. It does. And it's been my, my own experience of reading these types of uh, biography as well. I mean, my favorite... It's not an autobiography, unfortunately, but my favorite biography is actually of Matt Talbot. Um, if you've read Matt Talbot, um, I can't remember the author... Um, now, but it, but because his life was so banal, so he's blessed Matt Talbot now, but he was just this alcoholic who then gave it up as a for the Virgin Mary. But then, really, the majority of his life, he's just working in a woodyard and uh, doing small sort of feats that were hidden, and we never would have known about it um, unless he'd passed out in the street. But it's extremely. Um, You'd almost call it like a kitchen sink realism biography of this man who basically led a normal life. But there's something about the way it's written that, that resonated because, yeah, as you've, as I guess we've been saying, you know, you, you hear even the name Saint, right? It's like Saint Francis or Saint uh, Ignatius, etc. And you think, well, I'm never going to be able to do that. So I have to set up, I have to draw this ideal of who I am meant to be, which then you ignore yourself for ages until you ultimately fail, which you will, because you can't be anyone but yourself. And so to find those biographies or autobiographies of people who just lived regular lives and little things happened on the way, those are the ones which I think you go, ah, okay, now I understand what faith can be. <laughs> Very much so. And I think this is one of the reasons why when I taught, when I taught this class with this focus uh, to introductory students here at Loyola, it was a very common experience for me to have students who would say, I'm not religious. I don't intend to be religious, but I was, you know, deeply moved by what I was reading in these stories that if I confront my own brokenness, if I'm willing to face the truth of that for myself, is that not what we call faith? And am I not trying to live that life? Even if I'm not taking on any religious identity for myself. And I would say, yeah, I think you're grasping the heart of what's going on here. And they would say, huh, I'm, I'm kind of profoundly moved by that experience. And I think, well, that's, that's what we're trying to access here, right? There's this real, almost every day, you know, an everydayness to it. We can all confront it. We can all find this capacity. And then if we begin to realize that's the experience that, you know, this Christian tradition has been promoting for centuries in many ways, a confrontation with the self and its brokenness and an ability to surrender to something much larger than itself, while also recognizing that that narrative, that beautiful narrative of a person who's dying, and actually that's God's experience of dying to God's own self in some bizarre, bizarre way. Uh, that's a profound connection. And I think that could actually help us to understand uh, what revitalizing faith these days looks like, even if not something recognizable from before. You know, I mean, going forward with what faith looks like today, it's going to be very different than what it has looked like in the past. And I, I do think that taking time to analyze and to really pay attention to autobiographical narratives and how they re they reformulate theological operations for us might actually be able to enable us to speak to secular contexts or mm -hmm. you know the loss of faith of the the nuns that are out there n o n e s you know those who have no faith mm -hmm. because I was noticing with my students they they resonated with this they really liked this 
I thought, well, and it's like the most, it's the it's the most uh, almost cliche way of speaking about faith. Period. Someone you know gets broken in their life and they find God, and it all turns around. And you think, why would they even want to hear these stories? But they found themselves, you know, on the whole, deeply engrossed in those stories. I would say. Where would you advise people to begin with these types of biographies that isn't St. Augustine's Confessions? Well, I started the book actually with Mary Carr's Lit. And I think for me, for a lot of students too, it was one of those books where I would assign like a couple chapters from Mary Carr's book Lit. And then I would see students show up in class with the whole book. And I would say, oh, oh are you are you reading the whole book? Yes. I read the whole thing, you know, within two or three days. I couldn't put it down. I, I really do think Mary Carr's book Lit is a really phenomenal uh, again, like a reimagining, whether intentional or not, but a reimagining of Augustine's Confessions for our day and age. And she's just a wonderful, wonderful writer. Her language is, is absolutely beautiful. I think that's a powerful one. I also like Danny Shapiro's work. Uh, I mentioned Danny Shapiro's book, Devotion, in a chapter. Um, she's really fantastic, so relatable, and just has this great it's very different than Mary Carr's in many ways, but this great ability to to piece together the fragmented nature of our lives today, where everything seems so scattered, and we're not sure if we want to be part of an organized religion at all. And yet she speaks very truthfully about that experience. So I think Danny Shapiro's devotion is also a very good place to begin for a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've, we've covered a lot here in a short space of time. Is there anything about your book that you'd like to, to add in that you feel we've critically overlooked? No, I think, I, I mean, for me, I, like I said, the biggest, one of the biggest themes that came out of it was the way in which all these authors, I felt, really demonstrated a, a new rereading of the idea of a poverty of spirit and how that deeply affects the individual to engage their own poverty of their own life. And they realized that that's the story of this God as well, that God was a God who was impoverished in some way and even died. And then that gives us a whole way to reread you know, what, what Paul was really talking about, about dying to Christ and the emptiness within that actually is a connection to God. Um, no, I think that, yeah, that's sort of the main theme I was trying to get toward uh, in the book itself and even today while talking about this with you. So thanks for bringing all that up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is uh, Theology as Autobiography by Colby Dickinson, and this is by published by Cascade Books. So I'll be sure to put the links for... Um, the book in the description below and um yeah what are you what are you working on now um well i'm <laughs> coming out of another class i was teaching I, i've just finished a manuscript on a book on atheism atheism and love in the modern period so that's one that i'll be hopefully working uh toward publishing soon and then i have another one coming out also with cascade uh i guess maybe later this year or next year i don't know i'm still i'm still going to turn the final manuscript in soon about uh it's kind of like I, what do I call that book? <laughs> this is terrible. I forget the names. It's something like a uh, haunted. It's it's about hauntings is the basic idea about about how we are all haunted by something. And I think theology could be better understood in many ways if we if we really recognize what it is that haunts us, and not just in terms of like our repressed memories or the ghosts of our own lives, but that's part of it. But also in terms of again, power and privilege and realizing that we're all haunted by these inequalities in our world today. We're haunted by those who have been oppressed uh, in our in our world. Um, and also uh, the one of the final chapters is the I, the self, and how the self haunts our writings. And so I even get into this idea of talking about the self and allowing the self into what it is we're writing about in an academic discourse. All of that. And then you talk about the clash of egos, I talk about it as the idea of the sovereign self and how we're haunted by our weak side, right? Which sort of undermines our sovereign sense of who we are. So that's uh, kind of a more philosophical reflection, even on some of the same ideas we were talking about today. Yeah. Well, they both they both sound fascinating. Um, but once again, it's yeah. been a great discussion. And yeah, Colby Dickinson, thanks very much. Thank you, it's been great.